Bhagavad Gita, verse 2.5 It would be better to maintain my life in this world by begging than to kill these great personalities who are my gurus. Even though motivated by material gain, they remain my superiors. After killing them, any worldly enjoyment I might attain will be smeared with their blood. Sar Ardhavarshini Arjuna is saying to Krishna, You may ask how I will maintain my life if I do not decide to accept my own kingdom. My answer is that it is better for me to eat food acquired by begging and act condemned for kshatriyas than to kill my superiors. Even though such an act may bring defamation, I will not be beset with spiritual inauspiciousness. It is not proper to abandon my gurus simply because they are following the proud and irreligious Duryodhana, who is unable to discriminate between what is duty and what is not. If you say that it is recommended in the scriptures on morality, Mahabharata or Yoga Parva, to reject the guru if he is proud, unable to discriminate between good actions and bad, and engage in abominable activities, then my reply is Maha Nu Bhavan. There is the possibility of these defects in such great personalities as Bhishma and Drona, who have conquered lust, time and so forth. It may then be argued that man is a servant of wealth, but wealth is not the servant of anyone. This is confirmed in Bhishma's statement to Yudhishthira Maharaja. O oh, Maharaja, it is true that I am bound by the wealth of the Kauravas. Thus, if you say that Bhishma's reputation as a Maha Nubhavan, or great personality, has already been ruined by his admitting to being desirous of wealth, then I must reply, yes, this is true. Still, if I kill them, I will only feel the stress. For that reason, I am using words such as Arta Kaman, desirous of wealth. I can enjoy this wealth after killing all of the Kauravas, who are very greedy for it, but that wealth will be tainted with their blood. In other words, despite their greed for wealth, they will always be superiors. I will become a traitor by killing them, and any pleasure derived from that will be adulterated with sinful deeds. Sar Ardhavarshini Prakashikariti Being inattentive to Krishna's words due to being overpowered by grief and delusion, Arjuna once more asserted. What to speak of my own family members and relatives? I consider it an extremely inauspicious and sinful act to kill my gurus who are standing before me in this battle array. Drone Acharya, Krip Acharya, my most worshipful grandsire Bhishma and others, just for the sake of this petty material kingdom. The chance of attaining a place in the higher planets is completely lost for one who kills such superiors. Therefore, I consider it better to maintain my life in this world by begging. It is stated in the Kurma Purana, that person who gives instruction on the Vedas, as well as one's father, elder brother, king, maternal uncle, father-in-law, protector, paternal grandparents, relatives, and those who are elderly are all considered one's superiors. Sri Tron Acharya and Kripacharya, 
were born in high-class Brahmana families. Besides possessing knowledge of the science of archery, they were also scholars of the Vedas and the scriptures dealing with morality, Dharma Shastras, and they were also religious by nature. Arjuna saw them as his gurus. Drone Acharya, who had foreseen the possibility of war, made Arjuna vow that if for any reason they came face to face in battle, Arjuna must fight against him. Grandfather Bhishma, the son of King Shantanu and Gangadevi, remained a lifelong celibate. According to Srimad Bhagavatam 9.22.19, he was a devotee of Sri Krishna, extremely chivalrous in control of his senses, generous, conversant about the absolute truth and always true to his vows. Even death was under his control. He is prominent among the twelve Mahajanas or authorities on devotional service to the Supreme Lord. Srimad Bhagavatam 6.3.20 These twelve authorities are Lord Brahma, Narada, Shambhu, the four Kumaras, Kapila, Manu, Pralad, Janaka, Bhishma, Bali, Shukadeva Goswami and Yamaraja. Thus Bhishma, who knew the absolute truth, and was therefore the spiritual master of the whole world, was Arjuna's teacher in the same category as Drone Acharya. Even though he supported the Kauravas in the fight against the Pandavas, who were devotees of Sri Krishna, he is Krishna's very dear devotee and he always acts only for his pleasure. Bhishma is counted among the Yani Bhaktas. He said to Yudhishthira Maharaja, What can I do? I am completely bound by the wealth of the Kauravas. Although it is not my desire, I have to fight on their side. But I give you this benediction. You will be victorious in battle. Here, even though Grand Sai Bhishma externally appears to be greedy for wealth, and dependent on others, he is in fact the master of his senses and supremely independent. Therefore, to glorify him, in the present verse, Shuddha Saraswati, the transcendental knowledge potency, has combined the two words he and Mahanu Bhavan into Hima Hanu Bhavan. Hima indicates ice or snow. That which destroys Hima is called Himaha, sun or fire. And Anubhavan means one who has the capability. Therefore, a person who is extremely powerful, like the sun or fire, is Hima Hanubhavan. The powerful sun and fire can burn all impure objects without becoming contaminated themselves. They always remain pure. Similarly, Bhishma is Hima Hanubhavan, a greatly powerful person. It is said in Srimad Bhagavatam 10.33.29 that the sun or fire can burn all pure and impure objects and is thus known as Sarva Book, that which can consume everything without becoming impure itself. Similarly, even if a pure and powerful person appears to transgress the principles of religion, he remains completely free from all defects. Someone may say that the powerful Bhishma committed no injustice by taking the side of the Kauravas and fighting the Pandavas. One may question, however, how Krishna's topmost devotee could pierce the body of his worshipable Lord by sharp arrows. Is this a symptom of his bhakti? 
In answer, it is said, First, to allure the demons, Sri Krishna made his great devotee, Mahadeva Shankara, Lord Shiva, bridge the theory of illusion called Mayavada. Mayavad is nothing but converted Buddhism, and it is against the principles of the Vedas. From an external perspective, Mahadeva's preaching does not seem to be bhakti. But from the transcendental perspective, it is bhakti, because Mahadeva simply carried out the order of Bhagavan. Second, just as the great devotee Shankara took the side of Bana Suda and fought against Sri Krishna himself, similarly Bhishma took the side of the Kauravas against Sri Krishna. Where then is the question of his bhakti becoming lost? Third, to relieve Mother Earth from the burden of demonic forces, Sri Krishna wanted to annihilate their power in the Mahabharata conflict and re-establish religious principles. If Grandfather Bhishma and gurus like Drona Acharya had not assisted the imposing demonic side, then the battle at Kurukshetra would never have been possible. Therefore, by the personal will of Sri Krishna, who is omniscient, his bewildering spiritual potency named Yogamaya infused the heart of Bhishma with wicked tendencies to fight on the side of the opposing party. Thus Bhishma performed this act for the pleasure of Krishna. Fourth, in, this, in his commentary on a verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Jiva Goswami explains that in the Mahabharata war, by the will of Sri Krishna, a demonic mood entered Kransaya Bhishma's heart. Imbued with that mood, he aimed sharp arrows at Krishna. Otherwise, it would have been impossible for pure devotee like Bhishma to act in such a way. Fifth, the great devotee Kransaya Bhishma teaches ordinary devotees in the stage of practice, sadhakas, that even if a great personality like him accepts the food, water or association of materialistic persons, his mind will become contaminated and he will lose his discrimination. Sixth, Sri Bhagavan understood that Jaya and Vijaya wanted to satisfy him by fulfilling his desire to fight. He therefore inspired the four Kumaras to visit him and, in order to infuse inimical thoughts into the hearts of Jaya and Vijaya, he intentionally inspired the four Kumaras to curse them. This curse was just a pretense, because there is no possibility of any anger existing in Vaikuntha. What to speak of a curse? In fact, for the satisfaction and pleasure of Sri Bhagavan, Jaya and Vijaya personally begged to have an inimical mood, and by doing so, there was no diminution in their bhakti. Had Grandsire Bhishma shown any symptom of desiring to kill Krishna instead of pleasing him, he would have fallen from his position as a devotee forever. The Srimad Bhagavatam describes that on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, Grandsire Bhishma offered the following prayers glorifying Sri Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam 1.9.34 in his commentary on this verse, Srila Vishwana Chakavarti Thakur gives a very rustic description of Grand Sai Bhishma's devotional mood. He says that Bhishma perceives that, just as the dust raised from the hooves of the cows in Raja decorates the charming face of, of Sri Krishna and increases his beauty and sweetness, in the same way, 
the dust raised from the hooves of the horses on the battlefield also increases Sri Krishna's beauty and sweetness. There is nothing ugly in a beautiful object. Although dust in itself is not beautiful when it falls on the soft lotus-like face of Sri Krishna, it enhances his beauty and charm. When Krishna ran towards Bhishma carrying the wheel of a chariot, his hair was disheveled. Bhishma was then reminded of how Krishna's hair looks when upon returning from cow grazing, he runs behind the living cows as they quickly move towards their sheets. In this verse, the words Shrava, Vari, mean that to Krishna's forceful exertion in running towards Bhishma on the battlefield, drops of perspiration fell from his lotus-like face and beautiful limbs. To Bhishma, they appeared to be like the drops of perspiration caused by Krishna's exertion in the amorous war of Cupid. Krishna's running at Bhishma is also a manifestation of his mood of affection for his devotees. Krishna broke his own vow that he would not fight in order to keep Bhishma's vow to make Sri Krishna take up weapons against him. Grandsire Bhishma observes, The reddish marks appearing on the limbs of Sri Krishna, which are bruised and cut by my sharp arrows, look like the love bites made by the teeth of a passionate lover absorbed in passionate battle with her beloved. Although a young beloved may behave haughtily with her lover, whom she loves millions of times more than her own life, by marking him with her nails and teeth, she cannot be said to be devoid of love. Similarly, Bhishma's madness in Vira Rasa, the chivalrous mellow, is not an indication that he is devoid of Krishna Prema. Bhagavan Sri Krishna is Rasavai Saha, Taitriya Upanishad 2.7, meaning that he embodies the nectar of all mellows. Akila Rasamarita Murti. In order to fulfill Sri Krishna's desire to taste feelings of chivalry, Vira Rasa, Bhishma, one of his prominent devotees, took the side of the Kauravas and wounded the limbs of Sri Bhagavan. In this way, Bhishma fulfilled Sri Krishna's desire and thus pleased him. In Sri Mahabharata, it is seen that Bhagavan Sri Krishna took a vow to not use any weapon in the battle. On the other hand, Bhishma, his devotee, took a vow that if he could not induce Krishna to take up weapons, he could not be considered the son of Maharaja Shantanu. Bhagavan, who is affectionate to his devotees, Bhakta Vatsalya, broke his own vow to protect Bhishma's pledge. Srimad Bhagavatam 1.9.37 Grandsire Bhishma says, I offer my obeisances again and again unto Sri Bhagavan, who is particularly affectionate to his devotees. In order to protect my vow, he broke his own promise jumping from the chariot, taking a wheel in his hand and running towards me with great speed. Although he took the side of the opposing party, Grandfather Bhishma is a pure devotee. Of this, there is not even the slightest doubt. From the character of Bhishma Deva, we learn that whatever he does is favorable for the pleasure of Krishna and assists in Krishna's pastimes. 
His profound character is beyond any mundane reasoning. However, if a conditioned soul, while making a show of being a guru, imitates Bhishma and engages in prohibited action or commits offenses, he can never be considered a bona fide guru. Bhagavan Rishabhadeva has said in Srimad Bhagavatam 5.5.18 That guru is not a guru. That father is not a father. That mother is not a mother. That demigod is not a demigod. And that relative is not a relative who cannot protect us from the clutches of death, cannot bestow eternal life upon us, and cannot protect us from the ignorance of Maya, which keeps us engrossed and bound in this material existence of birth and death. Only a great personality who is throughoutly expert in the imports of the scriptures, who is endowed with realization of the absolute truth, and who is detached from this material world, is qualified to be a guru. Bali Maharaj rejected Shukra Acharya for this reason, because Shukra Acharya was opposed to the principles of Bhakti. Thus, it is the injunction of the scriptures to reject such an unqualified guru. There is no sin or fault in not surrendering to or not following an unqualified guru, nor indeed in rejecting him. In a Svayamvara, a test of prowess, to win the hand of a king's daughter, lifelong celibate Bhishma won the three daughters of the king of Kaji, present-day Varanasi, Amba, Ambika and Ambalalika. He arranged the marriage of Ambika and Ambalalika to his brother Vichitra Virya. The first girl, Amba, insisted on marrying Bhishma, but he had taken a vow of lifelong celibacy and thus rejected her request. Not finding any other solution, Amba approached Parashurama, Bhishma's spiritual master in the science of weaponry. Parashurama called Bhishma and ordered him to marry Amba, but Bhishma remained resolute. Parashurama told him either to marry her or fight with him. Bhishma accepted the fight while speaking the following words. Mahabharata Udyoga Parva 179.25 A guru who is engrossed in sense gratification, who is a fool with no ability to discriminate between proper and improper behavior, and who is following a path that is devoid of pure devotion, is a false guru. One should immediately reject him. A devotee as great as Bhishma cannot perform any activity opposed to the principles of Bhakti. And Parashurama is an incarnation of Bhagavan. Considering the vow of Bhishma to be righteous, Parashuram accepted defeat in this fight, which would have continued indefinitely because they were evenly matched. 